Donald Trump promises us a big wall. Hillary Clinton says government will guarantee us equal pay. Bernie Sanders promises all sorts of free stuff. Generally, young people like that. And yet I'm surrounded here by lots of young people, hundreds of them. Do you want the free stuff that Bernie... No! What do you want? Liberty! It's an unusual group. We're at the Students for Liberty Conference in Washington, D.C. That's our show tonight. And now, John Stossel. Thank you. Tonight, we're here with hundreds of college-age students from all over the country, all over the world, actually, though most of you are from America. And they have gathered here at the Students for Liberty Conference in Washington to talk about immigration, dictators, death cults, public choice theory, campus rape, the open society and its enemies, and more. This conference is titled The Liberty Vote, which kind of seems presumptuous. Among the current presidential candidates, I wonder who is the liberty candidate? Donald Trump? No. Hillary Clinton? No. I mean, even the question is vague. Americans can't even agree on what the word liberty means. To the Occupy Wall Street movement, liberty means taking from greedy banks and rich people and giving it to people who are so poor that they don't really have access to the benefits of American liberty. Alexis Goldstein says that. She was an activist for Occupy Wall Street, and she's got a point, right? If you're very poor, you don't have access to all the good parts of America that rich people have. But Patrice Lee of Generation Opportunity says, so what if there's some inequality? Government shouldn't try to force everything to be equal. We should care more about liberty. What do you mean? That's absolutely right. So a lot of Americans feel angry because the system is rigged against them. I totally agree with that. When you look at corporate welfare, when you look at uh, the, the protections that lots of big businesses and, frankly, some wealthy people are able to get through our tax code, you see how it's hard well, to be Well, how about it being rigged person. against you because you're black and you're a woman? Well, you know what? A I trooper. think we have come pretty far in this nation, John, when it comes to uh, equality for women and equality for people of color. But what we really need is opportunity. Don't try to give me a lift up. Let me be free in the marketplace. Why not give Take you my a lift passion. Up? Well, because you know what? That, that, that says that I'm not good enough on my own merits. And believe it or not, I'm pretty good, and so are a lot of the young people in this room right now. So what we really need... Alexis? I think that the system is rigged, and I think it's rigged in favor of corporate interests against the individual. So Donald Trump, for example, is able to use the bankruptcy code to discharge debt that he owes his lenders four times in bankruptcy. But students that go broke are unable to discharge their student loans in bankruptcy. Do you agree with Bernie Sanders, who says it's unfair, we got to redistribute? Well, right now, a lot of the wealth is redistributed upwards, right? The wealthiest Americans pay a lower effective tax rate than the bottom 20% of Americans. Let me jump in on, on that. The top 20% of earners pay about 86% of the personal income tax in this country. But that doesn't take into account state and local taxes, and poor people pay a larger percentage of their income to state and So local why don't we go taxes. to a free, a, a flat tax? It's simple. Eliminate because the loopholes and eliminate a, a lot of the, the ways that uh, corporate uh, corporations are able to secure special privileges and, and special benefits, and it makes it easier for everyone to do their taxes. I mean, how many of you guys are going to be doing your taxes soon? I would argue that wealthy people have a more benefit from taxation, and therefore they should pay more taxes. Can we move beyond sure. just taxes and look at opportunity? Government inserts itself in, in the marketplace in so many ways and takes away opportunity for people, young people, to get in there, uh, provide competition to some of the established companies. Like? like. For example, uh, my makeup and my hair was done by a young entrepreneurial woman. She told me she had to spend 1,500 hours getting uh, uh, license. We have too much government regulation uh, uh, impeding someone from being able to, to flourish in the marketplace and create opportunities for themselves. Alexis, you got a problem? <laughs> sectors leads to cartels like you look the at lack of regulation lack of regulation it's not too much yes. I would argue that the lack of regulation Let's in, be polite for example here. internet service providers most people don't have a choice you have to stick with Comcast you have to stick with Verizon and that's because the government is not enforcing their these antitrust laws monopolies. to break up these cartels let's talk about what Hillary says there's 
unequal pay. Men make more than women. You women on average make 77 cents. That needs to be fixed by government. So I think that government has a role to play in disclosure, for example. So the Obama administration... They have this plan, require every big company report salary data based on race, gender. They're going to police it and fix it. I worry about that. Number one, it's onerous for business. It's difficult for them to start collecting data on every single person based on ethnicity and gender They're already and race. Doing it, and especially and then to report it to the federal it's government, who then will go after them and sue them. It's going to turn into a shame game. And there's some nefarious motives that are at play that we may not be able to see right They're now. They're only going to sue so, if they have a demonstrated case based on the data. They can't just sue arbitrarily. And, and if case. women make less, that's proof that there's discrimination? There is a systemic discrimination across a particular income Maybe that people will investigate. the men just took riskier jobs, made other it's, choices. But they are asking them to, to document it by the same job. And wouldn't you encourage that? Well, what about background or how much say? time they took off? Maybe the women stayed home, had kids. Aren't there differences between there men and women? absolutely well, are. You we don't value them. child work, right? Most of the time and that the women And the government should make us early. value childbirth what by paying think? women more? Not childbirth, child care, child work providing for your family. But women actually do more work than men most of the time because it's I women disproportionately it. do the child care, the cooking, the cleaning. So I actually think women are working more than men. And, and government should fix that. I think government already has the laws on the books. If you want to repeal them, you can you can work through Congress to try to do that yeah, to prosecute that. discrimination. <laughs> Alexis, people on the left say you're not really free if you don't make a living wage. You agree? I think making a living wage is important. We're a very wealthy country and we should be able to provide What's for everybody a living here. Wage? So MIT actually has a great calculator. Uh, it's the living wage calculator and I think $15 an hour is a good starting point if you have to pick a single number. I can't well, what if she said three paying people $15 should, an hour? Should government pick any number? No! Patrice, <laughs> that sounds so cruel. Get government out of the way of trying to determine what the right wa wage is and making sure that onerous government regulations is not stopping a person from creating opportunities for themselves as an, as an, an entrepreneur or in the marketplace. What's wrong with setting a floor? When you're arbitrarily throwing out $15 an hour, 10 10 as the president had wanted, it sounds like, oh, this is a way to help poor people raise their families. That's a, that's a, that's a misnomer because nobody is raising a family on, on uh, $7 an hour, 725 Most It's just young people who are earning no, minimum wages. No, that's wages completely untrue. Seventy-five percent of people who are making the minimum wage are grown people. They are adults. They are not teenagers. They are people raising families. But why are you so cheap? Why 15 bucks? <laughs> why not 40 bucks? I think that $15 an hour is a good place to start. If the principle works that government can raise it, why not raise it more? It must hurt something at some point, right? I think that you need to be able to provide for your family, and I think that well, that is what government that, should be able to Why not 100 to bucks an hour? Because I, because, <laughs> because I think the data bears out $15 an hour as a starting point so that you can raise a family comfortably, and I think that is what government should be trying to achieve. And is that $15 an hour here in Washington, D.C. or San Francisco, or is it $15 an hour in Alabama? Here's your chance to ask questions of Alexis and Patrice. Please come up to the microphone. My question is, in regards to things like regulating the free market, making it not so free, how is it that we can regulate and legislate our economy, in your opinion, into prosperity? Government is setting rules to make sure that people play fairly. And when they don't set guidelines, for example, Wall Street ran rampant. We had the 2008 financial crisis. And look, they're trying to Make sure that the small upstart hedge funds don't break into the Wall Street cartel, and without regulation, that will continue. Okay, next. I am a young, aspiring entrepreneur, but unfortunately, with all the regulations that we have in our government, I have a question that I think a lot of us have on our minds. When did it become a crime to be successful? Something, I look at this regulation, what can I do? So. I think that that's an overstatement. I think what's cr you can't break the law, and when corporations are fined by nobody even knows what the law is they anymore. Break there the are law. so many. Yeah. Well, I think so. You don't think that HSBC should be fine when they launder money to drug cartels? You don't think that JP Morgan should be, legal. They're, should they're, be they're fine? Just, <laughs> and there's no laundering. It's just buying and selling. Let's go to the next question, please. 
Now, among all of the free things that Bernie Sanders wants to give us, he wants to give us free college. And one thing that my peers are really looking at is the rising costs of college. So how can we reform the system? Do we need to reform the system of financial aid? What can we do to make college more manageable? Telling us we'll give you free college is pandering to the youth vote. What we really need is to see the college higher education disrupted in, in lots of different ways. Um, well, Alexis, you're shaking your head. Isn't so that pandering right, to the youth? Right now, we spend over $8 billion a year giving Pell Grants and GI Bill money to for-profit colleges who are failing left and right. Corinthian College right, is so collapsing into all. bankruptcy. You You're can redirect that into free public higher education. You need $15. Which is just an extension of K-12, a K, uh, failed K-12 system. It's a K through 14 failing. <laughs> alternative to public universities, the for-profit college systems are failing left and so right. Their profits stocks bad, are plummeting. Profits bad, the publicly is run is good. I would agree with that, yes. We have in the realm world. of education. Yes, the for-profit <laughs> model has failed. For every dollar of federal spending, colleges and universities increase their cost by 55 to 65 cents. They know they have Washington shoveling dollars right into them, so they have no reason to compete and lower their costs. You talk about administrative costs, that's absolutely part of it. But let's talk about expanding what it means to be educated and a productive citizen in this economy. It doesn't necessarily mean a four-year degree. That's what we've been told. But there are lots of alternatives to a four-year degree that can position someone, a young person, really well. I'm an individual. I want to be treated as such, not a one-size government fits one-size fits all government policy. No one a four-year public that. They're saying what? people should have an opportunity. You to get the last public. word. No one is proposing a one-size fits all. All they're saying is state schools two and four years should be free. And I think that that's a good idea. Thank you, Alexis. Patrice, uh, I hope you join this argument. You can do it by following me on Twitter, John Stossel. Use the hashtag IS, ISFLC16. This is such a stupid hashtag. It stands for <laughs> International Students for Liberty Conference 2016, but if you can find it. Uh, or just more simply like my Facebook page and then you can post on my wall. Next, Bernie Sanders has become popular with voters your age. Why? What's wrong with people your age? What's <laughs> going on? That'll be next. And also I'll debate a libertarian who's much smarter than me, but he says Sanders is actually a good candidate for liberty. We'll find out why he says that when we come back. Thank you. We're back at the Students for Liberty conference. More than a thousand students have gathered here in Washington, D.C. to advocate for a free society, and that includes free speech, free thought, right to start a business, a right to try new things. You want that? Yeah. But this presidential campaign, one surprise has been the success of an old Democrat socialist candidate, Bernie Sanders. He wants government to have more power and money. And for that, he's getting big support from people your age. What's that about? Well, Emily Eakins of the Cato Institute, a pollster who studies voters who say they feel the burn. What's wrong with those people? <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with young people today, but I do think that Bernie Sanders has captured their hearts and minds um, in ways that other candidates like President Obama and also Ronald Reagan did in the past. They like inspiring, honest candidates who they feel care a lot about them. Bernie Sanders is actually the most civil libertarian candidate of all the different presidential candidates. So after Rand Paul, we found that people who score high, who score high on um, a preference for libertarianism go to Bernie Sanders next. It's surprising because Sanders' economic planning would take power from individuals and give it to the state. Young people are just not that alarmed about socialism. Across a number of different polls, we see that young people are the most supportive of socialism compared to older cohorts, and they're about as likely to say they like capitalism as socialism. So are they dumb? <laughs> are you dumb? Are your friends dumb? <laughs> <laughs> yes? It's a 
it is young people don't know what the technical definition of socialism is. A recent poll um, asked people to use their own words to define it, and only 16% of millennials were able to do it. Um, they grew up after the Cold War. They don't remember socialism in the context of the Soviet Union like older people do. For young people, socialism means Scandinavia. So that's something I think that needs to be corrected, is that Scandinavia is not socialist. The Prime Minister of Denmark even went after Bernie Sanders and said, stop calling a socialist. We are a free market economy, and in fact, they are, and across a number of different economic indicators, uh, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark actually outrank the United States on property rights freedom, um, uh, the ease of starting a business. When they liberalized their markets like that, that actually helped. Got rid of labor laws. Yes. That actually helped, that's a, that accommodates their large social welfare states. And that's what Bernie Sand, he's talking about their large social welfare states. He's not acknowledging how they liberalized their economies in the 90s that actually helps pay for the social welfare state. How many of you would consider voting for Bernie Sanders? No. No one here? <laughs> When government is planning either an industry or an entire economy, it tends to result in the same set of consequences, which are long lines, rationing, lower quality care, and less innovation. If you want less innovation, then we can, we can embrace those systems. But if you want to have a cure for cancer, if you want to have a cure for HIV in the future, you have to have innovation, you have to have free markets, even in the healthcare system. Your polling has found that millennials start to turn against socialism, the more money they start to make. That's exactly right. We found that as millennials started to make between forty and $60,000 a year, their support for income redistribution flips, and their support for raising taxes to increase spending. This makes it sound like it's all about selfishness. Selfishness? No, I don't think that that's it. I think as young people start making sacrifices, they start working longer hours, paying uh, more in taxes, um, buy a house, have kids, they want to be rewarded more for those efforts. And that's actually what most Americans think. Questions for Emily Eakins. Um, on the popular Netflix TV series, House of Cards, which I'm sure you've heard of, the main character, President Frank Underwood, states to the public that you are entitled to nothing. Sounds right to me. You're entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The root idea of socialism is that everyone should be rewarded equally or at least according to their need, regardless of their achievements and efforts. A question that really gets at the, gets at the root of this is a question about kids' sports trophies. We asked about it on a recent poll where we asked, should all kids who play on a sports team get a trophy for their participation or, so, or should only the kids who win get a trophy? A majority of Americans, 57%, said only the kids who win should get a trophy at the end of the day. But one group stood out who thought all kids should get a trophy regardless of what they do. And that were, th those were the 18 to 24 year olds, college age Americans. <laughs> The socialists. <laughs> Next question. I'm a state representative in the south of Brazil. Uh, a huge concern from parents and students in Brazil are that uh, many, prof many teachers in school, they indoctrinate in socialism and Marxism instead of giving education. If this is the case in the United States as well, what to do about it? Now a lot of people are not learning about what happened in the Soviet Union when they had an experiment with socialism or other countries that have experimented with socialism. Instead we talk about socialism as if it's Scandinavia and they're not even socialists. So let's talk about history, see what, could, what, what can we learn from those experiments. And they didn't go well um, and I think we should be teaching But that your whole schools. continent has experimented with socialism, it hasn't gone well and they keep doing it. They do, so, and we have to do something about it, so that's why we're here, actually. <laughs> thank you, audience, and thank you, Emily Eakins. Next, should government be able to look into your smartphone? Students for Liberty. Almost all of you have one of these things, a smartphone. How many of you actually worry that the government's going to watch what you do, spy on you? I mean, some people want to kill us. We all post things on Facebook or Snapchat 
that are embarrassing that anybody can see. It's, it's in the cloud. Why is it worse if government does it? My next guest says I'm out to lunch even for asking these questions. Kalia Barnes is with the Electronic Privacy Center. I'm thinking about this the wrong way? Absolutely, John. So, look, privacy is a fundamental right. And so it, is life. People want to kill us. Yeah, but when you're looking at it amid massive government surveillance, private companies gobbling up your information left and right, universities too, we have to fight now more than ever to protect our right to privacy. But I voluntarily give it to the university or to Facebook. But you actually don't. So as a student, right, you're going to class and your, your university says, we're going to use this particular email platform, but you didn't sign up to have that information data mined. When you're posting your information on Facebook, you're not intending for an employer or somebody who can make a credit decision or a housing decision to take your private information and use it in a way you didn't intend. But if I want credit, then I have to submit information. And if the best information is data mining my phone, what's the harm? Well, the harm there is that uh, somebody can take uh, information that shouldn't be uh, included, whether you are expecting a child, whether you have uh, a medical condition, your sexual orientation, information that should not be collected and use it against you in ways that you never intended. But the government says, in the case of our safety, that it's going to save lives. It's a best way to find a terrorist connection, not listening to my call, but this harmless data mining, just seeing if I have a lot of patterns of talking to terrorists, and then they'll get a warrant and get more. That's not what the Fourth Amendment requires. And when we look at it, the Fourth Amendment is the right of the people to be secure against, uh, in their papers, persons and effects against unreasonable government uh, searches. The idea is that the, the individual should be secure as opposed to government overreach. NSA says this is a reasonable government search. It's absolutely not reasonable. All of the records, all of the call records, that they were gobbling. This is ineffective and it's violating our Fourth Amendment. It's violating our fundamental right to privacy. They're clapping, but don't you think this might detect a terrorist attack before it happens? Uh, the information shows that this has not been the case at all. The current case that's big is the San Bernardino terrorist phone might reveal something about who they were conspiring with. Apple says, no, we will not find you a way in. And I, let me poll the audience. Should Apple let them in? No. So what Apple is saying is that they do not want to set the precedent that will then unlock the phones for hundreds of millions of Apple users uh, in these types of situations. Comments for Kalia Barnes or questions? Come on up. In my county, the county sheriff partnered with the feds uh, to bring in hailstorm devices which uh, gather uh, cell phone in data uh, in a dragnet manner without a warrant. Uh, so this is uh, technology. Looking for what? Uh, just looking um, for uh, terrorists, supposedly, but they won't uh, provide the records. So uh, are there any uh, other uh, instances, uh, tr uh, troubling instances of uh, the government uh, weaponizing technology to invade our lives and invade our privacy out there? Absolutely. So this would be one of the examples of uh, a fusion center where you have a federal government agency partnering up with local law enforcement. And it routinely starts off as looking for terrorist activities, but more and more you see a mission creep. You're catching petty crimes, you're catching drug dealing and, prosecution, and, your, and prostitution like that. So this would be a, a classic example of overreach and where we... They would say, yeah, we're catching criminals. No, but here's the thing. We have a legal process, right? You can't just simply go and do a dragnet search of everybody in here. We have the Why Fourth not Amendment if we catch in place. Criminals? Because of a little thing called the Fourth Amendment. It requires a warrant. <laughs> What would you say to the argument of if you have nothing to fear, you have nothing to hide, or the other way around? Right. So we, we hear that a lot, but, and that just fundally, fundamentally misunderstands the way privacy works. Privacy isn't about whether you're doing something wrong. The information belongs to you, right? Imagine where you have maybe a wife looking for divorce attorneys, and that information pops up on the family <laughs> computer. She doesn't have anything to hide. This is her right to look up certain information, and it's simply no one else's business going on, going on there. All 
also there may be various other things that you're looking at your information could make you uh, an outsider in your community a pariah based upon political affiliations it has nothing not, you've done nothing wrong uh, but yet that information can sometimes be used against you thank you Thank you, Kalia Barnes. Coming up, we get to argue with a Donald Trump supporter. That's next. the Students for Liberty conference. The theme of this conference, as you can see, is the Liberty Vote. So who should get that? I mean, how many of you think it should go to Donald Trump? No. <laughs> Gary Johnson. Well, hang on that. My, Michael John, a Tea Party leader, says he'll vote for Trump and thinks everybody should. So welcome. And Thank you. We've got a tough audience here. <laughs> That's okay. We, we don't think of Trump as a, as a liberty guy. That's part of the challenge of this candidacy is that he's going to have to, to win, I think, establish a lot of credibility with the conservative movement, which to the credit of this liberty movement, libertarians and, and traditional conservatism, has really become the foundation of the Republican Party. And you're a Tea Party guy. I am. I'm, I'm a co-founder of the Tea Party movement and, and uh, run Tea Party community. Uh, dot com. So I'm very um, aware, actually, of some of the trepidation that might exist out there from uh, the liberty and libertarian movement as it relates to Trump. Yeah, well, I'll but I think his specific. positions are defensible. Bigging a building a big wall. I don't think it's any secret to anyone that we have in ISIS and global terror movements generally a great degree of commitment to penetrating into this country. It's they evil. intend to exploit the open border. So number one, this is a flat out national security issue, which is really a foundational principle, I think we would all agree, of government enumerated in our, in our, in our, in our Constitution. Number two, the employment situation in this country is abysmal, as bad as it's ever been. We start by defending liberty, by making America strong. He uses his phrase, make America great again. You might consider it a cliche. Over and over again. It's yes. not a cliche, however. America, America needs to be great in the, in the sense that we're creating jobs, we're defending our country, we're respected around the world, and we have, we have restored ourselves to the principles that once guided the country. Foreign workers are being brought in un, ostensibly because the skill sets that they offer are not available in our labor force. Well, in reality, what those that are, are uh, encountering this are learning is those skill sets absolutely do exist. These foreign visas are being issued to bring people in to train their replacements and to drive wages down. So the deflationary- But Donald Trump, your candidate, did that on his golf course. He had local applicants, he said they weren't any good, and he was getting- I think to look at this Trump candidacy, you have to, and this is a leap of faith, admittedly, you've got to look at it in a, pre <laughs> okay, but as it is, as it is with any candidate that you want to, you want to discuss here, okay, every one, I could sit here and rattle off areas that w w will give you good reason to not have trust and to have deep concerns, all right? As it relates to Trump, he's not a professional politician. He's not spent his life watching every word he said. Is he for single payer health care? No, and I don't know, I would like to know, and I think a lot of people closer to this campaign would like to know where that comes from. You hear Ted Cruz say it all the time, but when you, wait, hold on a second, when you, when you discuss an expansion of medical savings accounts, when you discuss what he called the lines, which is really getting rid of the lines, which is really getting rid of the interstate restrictions that exist on the purchase of health insurance, you are talking about strengthening a private sector, not a public sector, healthcare system. And then now, we'll have so much winning, you'll get sick of winning. Now here, with Trump, you have questions for Michael. Come to the microphone. Oh, they're eager to talk to you. Okay. How can you as a Tea Party member say that you support freedom if you don't support free and open borders? And how can you say that you're a fiscal conservative if you support candidates that want endless war? Okay, I think you could make the argument that Trump, more than any other candidate, has been a critic of our engagement 
in Iraq clearly has raised major reservations about uh, nation building. He's the only uh, GOP candidate who has said openly and uh, forthrightly that our engagement in Iraq was a mistake without being pushed into it. He said that proactively. He, he has been less vocal about going to war than Cruz, Rubio, Bush, Kasich, yeah. the other yeah. Republicans. But if those people are Tea Partiers as well. Now, to your earlier issue of the border, you have to decide, are we in the business of building a world aligned with our ideological principles at the surrender of our country, or are we in the business of defending a country and having a country. Now, it's my understanding the Tea Party came about as a rebellion of big government. Yes. But Donald Trump is an authoritarian across the board and supports big government across the board. Well, let's take a look at it. Number one, uh, if you've had a chance to review his tax policy, which if you haven't, you should go and take a look at it on, big on cuts. the site. Big cuts, okay, including at every no margin. No cuts in spending, but uh, and and into. <laughs> he's he he is a clear um, ally of our position that we share collectively against Common Core and federal engagement in, in, in education. He's been very forthright in saying that the federal government has overstepped that. He's a champion of school choice, and I think you're looking at a candidate who would say be the first to say yes. I acknowledge this government's gotten too big, out of control. Filled with waste. Thank you, Michael Thank John, you. for taking these questions. Thank Coming you. up, if this audience won't support Trump, and you won't, clearly, uh, who will you vote for? Uh, we'll find out. Also, I'll debate that libertarian who says Bernie Sanders gets a lot more. Right. Thank you. This year's theme for the Students for Liberty Conference is the Liberty Vote. When it's time for me to vote for president, I don't know whom I'll pick. My preferred Republican candidate dropped out. That was Senator Rand Paul. Why didn't, why didn't he do better? I, I don't know. But Jerry Taylor says he knows. Uh, Jerry's president of the libertarian think tank that is Cannon Center. He used to be with the Cato Institute. He's a smart guy who's taught me stuff. But now he says libertarians ought to be less pure. Not quite. I think libertarians need to be a little bit more realistic. The best investigation of how many people in America think like we do in this crowd, uh, it's about 5%, and that's being generous. I mean, I, my candidate was Ron Paul, too, and he didn't make it. He had his teeth kicked in by a variety of authoritarians who are taking this country in the most illiberty direction I've ever seen in my lifetime. My point is, <laughs> for 35 years we've organized and moved libertarian ideas and we haven't gotten very far and unless we rethink what we're selling and how we're selling it, we're going to keep coming back to meetings mm -hmm. like this talking about a libertarian rethink moment. Rethink it that how? Isn't here. Rethink it how? Let me give you an example. One of the reasons that people in academia and intellectual life in American politics have a hard time with libertarians is when Rand Paul says things like, well, if I was a senator in 1964, I would have voted against the Civil Rights Act. Why? Because he believed in protecting the rights of people to discriminate against others. Most Americans are not going to embrace a candidate who says tough, people should just suffer in the, under the teeth of bigotry because But Rand white people Paul have that just right. said I object to two parts of the nine parts which outlaw private discrimination, saying in your private business you get to say I'll only serve people if they stand on their heads if you want. Right, and 5% of the American public says yes to that and 95% say no, and in my opinion rightly so. What, what else could Rand Paul say that would have changed somebody's mind? Even people like Milton Friedman and F.A. Hayek supported a robust welfare safety net to help the indigent and the poor. But a safety and net, but how robust? It's grown from a safety net to this giant hammock. 65% of all entitlement spending don't go to poor people. It is a picture of deep distress. And if you don't address it, what do you get? You get Donald Trump campaigns where immigrants are scapegoated for economic problems, foreign trade is scapegoated for economic problems, and we don't find ourselves in a more liberty world. We find ourselves moving in exactly the opposite direction. We shouldn't support open free trade? We should absolutely support open free trade, but we're not going to get open free trade if people think that in the, in the economy they operate in, 
If there's not a safety net and they don't think they'll be taken care of, they're not going to brace a laissez-faire economy. And that's but just the unfortunate There is fact a safety net. It's just there. Not very robust, which is why they turn to people like Bernie Sanders, which if you look at what the average poor person receives, for instance, food stamps. We hear a lot about that. You know what the average household uh, receipt is for food stamps? A few dollars a day. They're not getting rich on food stamps. And yet you hear stories on the right all the time about how people don't get jobs because they want to get food stamps. That's ridiculous. If we had to choose between a robust social welfare safety net and a free market economy, or less of a safety net, less protection for the poor, and thus a more regulated, less free economy, which would you choose? So your plan for victory is to surrender? No, it's not to surrender. <laughs> I don't believe it's a surrender when you tell people that we're gonna have a laissez-faire economy, and, in, and if you were not blessed moving into this economy, the skill set and characteristics that allow you to contribute, tough. I don't think that's surrender. And you say we should be more sympathetic to Sanders. On civil liberties and foreign policy, he's arguably the most libertarian candidate in this race. On economic issues, he's not. But there's more to liberty than the price of ketchup. But economics really matters. Gotta economics matters, but so does... <laughs> Audience, questions for Jerry Taylor. I think one of the reasons why your founding fathers created this country to be federal is that states can compete uh, among each other uh, with the welfare systems. One state can have it, another will not have it. That's one of the reasons why people are constantly moving from the People's Republic of California to the free state of Arizona. Yeah, why should the feds run it? Well, there's a pretty good argument that you want competition in government, and there's no principled objection to that. But when we as libertarians talk about the poor and the indigent, our narrative, in my opinion, cannot be Taxation is theft. Taking from A to give to B is a gross violation of all that is right and holy. And if you can't contribute to a market economy, beg for your supper or go dive through a dumpster. We can't say that without finding ourselves in the current position where we are, which is 5% of the American public and near political irrelevance in Washington. Bernie Sanders is great, Medicare for all. He wants to expand Social Security. He wants, he wants all of this. And uh, how, like, how is that? not a legitimate complaint when he wants to expand the welfare for the middle class, not just the poor. It's a perfectly legitimate complaint. I agree with you 100%. And I think libertarians have an opportunity to say, look, if we are going to take from some to give to the others, let the others be poor people who need it, not middle class people who don't need it. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity and opening for libertarians to fill a void in American politics. And I hope that we can get there. What's the point of having a free market economy where we can become wealthier when 60% or 70% of our wealth is then taken away from us? Well, let's just engage, seriously engage in this thought experiment. What if it is indeed the case that since most people in America are not hardwired like us, and I think we, like us, and I think we all know that perfectly well, right? We're in college campuses, we know that libertarians are not typical amongst your classmates. So if we know that's the case, and we know that people are not going to embrace a laissez-faire, hotly competitive economy without trade barriers or labor barriers, and it just essentially lets the economy rip, and they're not gonna embrace that unless there's some sort of guarantee that if they can't contribute productively to that economy, they're gonna disappear and fall through the cracks. Thank you, Jerry Taylor. I hope you're wrong. Coming up, <laughs> you get to vote for a president. Who will they pick? are not happy with our choices this election season. On the left, we've got, what, big government Democrats who want to increase regulation, taxes, give government more power over our lives. On the right, we've got big government Republicans who want to spend more on the military and police people's bedrooms. So who do we libertarians have to vote for? Well, there will be a libertarian candidate. The Libertarian Convention is this Memorial Day weekend. The Stossel Show plans to hold a forum for the three leading candidates, and at the moment they are former New Mexico Governor Gary Johnson, Libertarian Republic founder Austin Peterson, and software entrepreneur John McAfee. They'll debate, and we can decide who we think would be the best president. All of them would be better than the current front runners, uh, Hillary and Donald, 
But unfortunately, third party candidates haven't done well in American presidential elections. So as a thought experiment, let me ask you, if you have to vote for one of the current Democratic or Republican candidates, whom would you vote for? Wouldn't vote. All right, but if you have to vote, I'll list the candidates in the order of how they're doing at electionbettingodds.com because that's the best prediction market that gives the most accurate forecast of what will happen in elections. And at electionbettingodds.com, the front runner right now is Hillary. So will anyone here vote for Hillary? No. Let us, yes, we got one. Okay. Anybody vote for Trump? Is this guy convinced? And we have a couple. Bernie Sanders, a few more, Marco Rubio, okay, a bunch for him, Ted Cruz, all right, we got some Cruz and Rubio, and how many say no one because they're all awful, they're all statists, <laughs> it's the sentiment here. The good news is that we are a government of checks and balances, so there's a limit to what bad things these politicians can do to us. And maybe our semi-free market will still allow American entrepreneurs to grow the economy more than politicians can crush it. <laughs> might that open? You think it might happen? Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope for it. That's our show from Students for Liberty. We'll be back in New York next week. Good night.